very exciting, right? Um, so I, I'm so thrilled to welcome Britt Marling. Oh, it's so nice to be here. Thank you guys for joining us on a Sunday morning. A little intense for a Sunday morning, but yeah. So I want to start just by asking you about the genesis of this idea. You've been working on it for five years. A Where did it come time. from? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, actually, we had a friend of ours um, was invited on one of these kind of technology, you know, billionaire retreats. And he was telling us some stories from that experience. And I was like, oh, you know, he just got this cryptic invitation. And he had to just show up at a private airport, got on a plane, didn't know where he was going. Like, who are all these people on the plane? And the experience was so evocative. Of course, no one died on his <laughs> retreat. But um, we thought this is such a ripe setting for a murder mystery. And at that time, we were thinking a lot about the whodunit as a genre, I think because we're kind of living in a time where everyone's looking around a little bit and being like, OK, whodunit? Like, how did we get here? <laughs> There's so many things to contend with. Um, and we did some research on the genre, and it kind of rose to popularity for the first time between the First and Second World War which is, I think, another time in history when everyone was kind of looking around and being like, wait, how did we get to this place? Um, and the old whodunit really was mostly set in the English manor, which was the seat of power then. But the new seat of power very much feels like it's coming out of Silicon Valley. So it just felt like, ah, this is a way we can do a modern whodunit and make it feel really real, hopefully, instead of you know, kind of tongue-in-cheek. Yeah. So, um, so you have this idea for a whodunit, but this is really two whodunits that are sort of woven together. How did that idea, how did the idea to come to sort of weave those two different stories together? That's such a good question. You know, I, I mean, it, we knew we wanted a young woman as a private eye because it felt it very exciting to take that genre and put it through the lens of a, of a, of a, of a girl, really, who's coming of age. Um, and so we, s we saw that from the beginning. We saw that amateur sleuthdom was a way that you could make it credible um, because you could be a Gen Z you know, girl who grew up in the Midwest as the coroner's daughter and have actually logged 10,000 hours on the internet solving cold cases with other amateur sleuths. So that felt real and believable. But I think as we started writing, we thought, oh, it turned out it's a lot harder to get the audience on board for that idea than you would think. It's like... You know, if you're watching True Detective, which I really love the first season of, you know, you, when you see Matt McConaughey and Woody Harrelson show up at the scene of the crime, their gender, their movie stardom, their badge, everything gives them the authority to be in that space. You don't have to do any work as a writer to sell that. But the moment you have a young woman there and she doesn't have a badge, you have to constantly give her in the writing the credibility or the authority to be doing it. So it felt very apparent that we had to weave in a backstory that was constantly saying to you, like, this is why she can be here. This is why when she's over the body, you know, we should believe that she could solve that crime. And so, and then I think it also felt really important to, I love a good mystery, but sometimes they can be really cerebral and cold. And it felt like if there was going to be a young woman at the center, it should be hot-blooded and passionate and you know, warm in a way. And so telling that uh, love story, really, as you, as you continue on with the season, it becomes very much about Bill and Darby's love story and the first case they ever solved, solved together. And we sort of braid those things. You braid them, but you also begin the story of the billionaire's retreat at the beginning, mm -hmm. but you begin Darby and Bill's story at the end. <laughs> I mean, it's such a fascinating choice. Like, was that something that you, did it take a lot of drafts to kind of get to that structural place? Or was that an, uh, an earlier decision about like the order of the storytelling? I love that you're asking this. Because I found out that she's a PhD in literature. Oh so like, God. guys, we're getting a deep cut on a Sunday morning. Sorry, that's how I do <laughs> it. But no, it, it's such a good question. And I think it was a real risk, you know, in some ways. Yeah. Um, but it, it felt like the right thing to do to start with Darby and Bill, the end of Darby and Bill's road trip, but reserve the very end because there's more that comes. You know, in the sixth and seventh chapter, you really see what happened after that moment they confront the, the serial killer and Darby stands up and says the names of all those women. Like, 
starting there, you think you understand a little bit of what's happening in that scene, but when you rewatch that scene later, after having the whole of the experience on the retreat in Iceland and also the whole of the experience on their road trip that takes them there, you watch that scene again and you understand it for the first time. I, I think we were really interested in general in the idea of thinking of time not as a linear thing, but as something more elliptical. You know, we built the circular hotel as a way of thinking about kind of the hands of time and Darby pacing these corridors. And we talked a lot, obviously, about how the past informs the present, but how about how the present informs or rewrites the past as you re-remember it? And every time you remember something, you're rewriting it, you know, you change the past. And then how does that go and enter the present again? And so I think we're trying to think of a way to do a murder mystery that also still felt metaphysical or um, ghostly in a way. Like I think the past really haunts Darby and she has to solve it in order to solve what's happening in the present. Yeah. But that's more of an internal emotional thing than it is a plot thing, yeah. which is maybe different from. Well, I mean, I think it's so, it's so interesting talking with, um, with writers and creators because some people will come to a like murder mystery concept with the mechanics and then sort of back work all of the emotional mm -hmm. things to kind of get like, all right, we know that this is going to happen, but mm -hmm. why? Mm -hmm. Are you coming, uh, you come from more of an emotional place first and then the plot comes? I think it's a bit of both. I mean, I've always, I it's funny, I know what you mean. There is a divorce between them, but I've always thought that like, if you get to a place of really deep character, the plot writes itself by virtue of what the character will do when they're meeting with resistance, you know, and the gap that opens between what the character does, what they expect to be the outcome of what they're doing, and then what actually happens. I think that gap is where, like, really good writing comes, if you can get that right. And so we try to spend a lot of time just making Darby feel really real, and Bill, and and Andy and all of these and all these people, and then you put them in together in a room, and if they're really real people, the plot sort of starts to unfold by virtue of their actions. Because um, I know what you mean. The other way, if you go the other way and you kind of reverse engineer it, I think sometimes the characters end up feeling a little bit like paper dolls that are kind of just in service to um, a labyrinth you've built in your mind that you're like walking them through. I like those too. That like. But they feel different. They feel different. Like I think w Chinatown, I think, is an amazing film. My God, I've watched that film uh, like 20 times at this point. And I, there are a lot of plot machinations in that, but I always feel so grounded in Giddy's point of view. Um, and it always feels like it's coming from him in a way, yeah. What are your favorite whodunits? What were you looking at as you were thinking about this? Oh, so many different things. But the best one really is Gosford Park. You guys seen Gosford Park? I mean, that movie is so fucking good. And it really stands, and Clive, Clive. I mean, what an incredible actor. He's so good in Gosford Park. And that's a movie that, I mean, I love that film a lot. I think it could have been even more emotional because the turn at the end is such an impacting reveal and I won't say what it is. Everyone should go watch Gosford you Park. You should go watch it. Um, but just to speak to what you're saying about I think I think uh, sometimes this genre tends to be about just the puzzlement, mm -hmm. and I think our aim was to try to tell something that by the time you got to the end, you feel a real sense of aha and surprise, but you also feel all the feels. You know, like it can move you to tears if it, you've done it right. Um, you were talking about making these characters real as you kind of gather everyone in this space. One of my favorite parts of the English country whodunit trope is like, and here's the old lady who comes and she's like this, and here's the like, <laughs> here's the young guy and he's in love with her, but she doesn't know. Yeah. And this is so fun, you know, this the these the I mean obviously it is a very serious uh, story that you're building, but there is a real sense of familiarity and play in the like, who are the people on the plane? Yeah. They're all of their job, you know. Yeah, yeah. How did you figure out who that cast was going to be? Who the who like what kinds of jobs? What sort of group of people were you trying to represent? Bringing everyone together. 
it was fun to think about the tech billionaires retreat and to try to work from that angle. Like who, if you're Andy Ronson and Lee, you know, his wife, and you're sitting there and you're planning this dinner party, like who needs to be, have a seat at the table to have the conversations he wants to have? And so it felt like, okay, well you need a roboticist, but you also need an activist, you know? And you need someone who's a hacker, but you also need an artist. And mixing up things from that, that felt sort of, um, from like disparate worlds and letting the friction of that make for interesting scenes felt really cool. And then A.V. Kaufman worked on, on this with us and she's an incredible casting director. And you can give A.V. Kaufman something so specific and she will like go out into the world and find that person. And so we've worked with her for a long time and on the OA too. And the OA was really challenging to cast. We would write her really specific descriptions and she'd be like, this person does not exist. <laughs> And then she would go post it. We were like, Avi, use the internet. And she would post it on the internet and then like get floods of you know amateur actor auditions coming in and we would go through them. And that's how we found Ian for the first time who played Buck in the OA. Um, yeah, so it's I, I feel, feel like we feel a confidence in writing with a lot of specificity because we trust that on the other side we have a partner in crime who can help us find who can play the role. Can you talk about casting Emma, who's so crucial for this? Oh my God, so crucial. Um, yeah, it's funny, these scripts were, um, like when we wrote the OA, I think people were very into it and moved to, to make it, you know, but there was a lot of things that were left mysterious in the OA. Like you would read the script and it would be like, and then they gather in the room and they do the movements, like all caps underlined, and people would be like, what the fuck is that, you know? <laughs> uh, and then we showed them. Um, but in this, it was more like everything's more robustly on the page. And so people would tear through the scripts and then just call us like breathless for the next one. And so that was an exciting feeling to feel that from just the two-dimensional blueprint stage of, of screenwriting. Um, but people would also say like, Darby Hart is so iconic. And we were like, what does that even mean? Like, sh she's not even real yet. Like, she's just this, like, she's a paper doll on the page. And so it felt quite intimidating. I've never felt so intimidated to cast someone because there, there was all this pressure of people just felt like she wasn't s a kind of person I guess they'd seen before on screen. And so um, we felt a little nervous about it. And then when I met Emma for the first time, like, all my nerves just fell away. It was like, they're an incredible person. They have a gravitas beyond their years. Like, and at the same time, while they're brilliant, they also have an incredible warmth. And it felt like, especially because we're putting Darby in this like frozen tundra, and in an intense story, that there's gotta be a lightness and a warmth there at the center that carries us through and makes us hopeful that this can be solved, the mysteries in our own lives can be solved. Um, and so no, Emma was just absolutely astonishing in this. and. Loved every minute of working with them. Yeah, I think I think part of the detective, the, the amateur sleuth detective challenge is always why is this person even doing this? Yeah. Right. Yeah. When it is a professionalized detective figure, and you're like, well, it's your job. <laughs> you know, that's why you're standing there. Yeah, yeah. And then of course they're you know angry or whatever, and that becomes a separate thing. But when it's the amateur sleuth the question, you have to create this sort of answer to why it is that you are being driven. And it feels like part of casting Emma was because they can do the obsessive side, which we see some of here. Yeah, yeah. But they also can do a sort of fundamental empathy that means that the answer to that question is just because they really care about. Completely, yeah, I love what you're saying. Um, I love what you're saying because I think initially when we were writing this, we thought, oh, we're gonna take the detective genre and we're just gonna put a young woman in it, it's gonna be fine. And then we went to like write the scripts and it's like, this is hard. Cause basically what you're doing is, normally you come into any crime scene movie, whether the detective is a man or you know a woman and they've got a badge, but usually the inciting incident is they come to a scene and it's a dead naked woman on the ground and she's beautiful and she's covered in blood and she might be mutilated. And that dark erotic charge of that image carry is the fuel, the jet fuel that carries us through the rest of the story. Like, that's intense to try to take that woman off the ground, take the blood off her face, you know, dress her, and be like, actually, this is who's gonna solve the crime. And there's something about that that's more challenging than you think. I felt it myself when writing Darby that my own internalized misogyny would get in the way a lot. 
And uh, so it, it, I think that's part of why the backstory was so important to continually tell her origin story at the same time, was to kind of be like, okay, this is the coroner's daughter. You know, she grew up in a morgue. Like she went to high school smelling of formaldehyde, like not very popular, but knows a lot about a crime scene. And when she was a little kid and follows her dad out uh, for the first time to a crime scene, and y'all see this if you keep watching. Um, when you keep watching, when to be when clear. You <laughs> Are you gonna keep watching? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a moment you'll see in chapter two, and this is not a spoiler, where she, her dad, you know, she, she doesn't have a mom. The dad, you know, has her in the car, and he's like, I'm gonna go out to this scene. Like, you stay in the car. And she watches him walk out, and then she follows him out there. I have the same reaction, yeah. <laughs> Um, he, she, f she follows him out there, and it's like all these men of authority over this, you know, the the dead body of a woman that you don't really see, and she's at the level of the woman, you know, and she, they're just chatting about the Knicks game and chatting about the weather, and she's having this intense coming of age experience where she's realizing that coming of age as a woman often means coming into an awareness of a great likelihood of violence against you. That's her coming of age moment. Is not like a step into life, but a step into an awareness of your own mortality potentially. Or the, and so I think to your point, it's that that compels her, which is so different from what we normally see when we watch these kinds of stories. Like nobody's paying her; she's an amateur. You know, she doesn't have a badge. It's not a career. She just feels lit from within to attempt to keep some of these cases that often fall through the cracks from falling through the cracks. And there's a lot of amateur sleuths who really do this, like spend hours solving things in their basements or attics while their families are like having dinner, you know, and they become obsessed because um, they're able to solve stuff together that, that couldn't be solved before, you know, cases that are like decades old. Yeah. I was thinking about, I mean, I, so I love the whodunit as a, as a shape, um, but one of the things that occurred to me as I was thinking about this show, and um, I've had the opportunity to watch all of it, which I highly recommend that everyone does, um, but they pretty famously have endings. Like they <laughs> <laughs> they come, I mean, the whole point is that is the end, is that the en is the yeah. end has to happen. And yeah. that, that actually they are sort of a magnet of like, constantly trying to, of the ending is sort of coming all the time That's and sort of holding so it away. That's so true. Yeah. Um, oh my God, I love that. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and uh, but I was thinking about that from your previous TV experiences yeah. and the appeal of writing a form where you're gonna be like, it's a, it, by the end of this, there will be an ending. Yeah, yeah. And I was curious whether part of the appeal of it is that there was trepidation about it working on this previous thing where the ending was not under your control. You know, that's such a good question. It's so funny. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like, it was very hard when the OA was ended before it had actually ended. But I think, and this could be crazy, but I think as old I still think like, well, you never know, you know? Twin Peaks came back after 10 years and the ending exists in our minds. So you just don't know what's gonna happen. You know, climates and circumstances change and, and it felt like maybe it just was a story that came a little early and inspired a lot of different metaphysical stories, but like needed to go dormant for a bit and might come back. So I think we felt sometimes sad, but I don't think we felt burned, you know? And so when this story started to grow in our minds, it was just like a flower that just shot up in the early pandemic. And it felt like for some reason, Darby Hart was the story for this time in which like, it feels like culturally, the vibe is that everyone is always trying to make us feel impotent or that like we can't really do anything about these huge situations, the climate crisis, the unraveled democracy, like how smartphones are changing our brains. We felt like, oh, can't we tell a story where like you don't feel that, where you like get to the end and you're like, no, actually we're all quite powerful and we're especially powerful when we connect with each other. And, and like, so there was something about that that just felt right and, that, and then because it, was about being invited on this retreat in this space. It just had a clear beginning, middle, and end, you know? Um, and I just felt like the truth of this story. I mean, I guess you could, in success, if people enjoy this series, you could take Darby and move her to Shanghai, move her to Detroit. You know, there's all kinds of, I think, stories you could tell with someone that young, really fully coming of age. 
Um, but I would also be really happy. I feel very, I feel very proud of this story as just its own novel. And we'll see what other people think. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about the setting. Uh, it feels we see this opening of this motel in this uh, in Utah, I think, and it's this very desolate space. Yeah. And then you get the hotel in this frozen tundra, and they yeah. sort of mirror each other. Yeah. But I'm curious about what it was about the this sort of desolate background that felt like it was where this needed to be. Oh, it's a good, yeah, I love the way you, uh, yeah, I get what you're saying here. Because I used to, like, I would think about that, and I'd be like, oh, yeah, well, just cinematically, we were like, ooh, the frozen tundra is I mean, beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. Cut to the deserts, and it's going to be reds and blues and the reds, and <laughs> you will get to that, you know, chapter five, chapter six, that really kicks off. But I actually think it was maybe a huge part of it, I'm realizing from how you frame that, is that there was something about those open plains, like treeless, and the wind rushing across both of those spaces that felt a little bit like the haunt or melancholy of these times a little bit. There, I mean, we're telling this like cross-country road trip story inside this about two young people who are falling in love, but they're not just like falling in love on a road trip. They're like, falling in love picking up the bones of women as they like cross the country. And I remember thinking a lot about Rihanna's song, We Fell in Love in a Hopeless Place, you know? <laughs> and I think, we all are feeling uh, this, these strange feelings coming out of the pandemic and in the climate crisis. And there's a lot at play and there, there's a certain darkness that sometimes feels overwhelming. And I think we wanted to try to tell a story that was honest about that, like didn't look away. It looks, but it somehow still retains like a, a sharp edged optimism or a belief in, in people and in what people can do you know, when they when they join forces like Darby and Bill, or you know, in the case of the retreat, I mean, no, I don't want to spoil anything, but like you've got a the feeling that you've got to work with each other, and that if we can kind of break out of the isolation that so much of technology is reinforcing or imposing, um, and like really band together in real time, it feels like a lot is possible still. Yeah, I wanna um, I wanna ask you about directing. Oh yeah. I, I found an interview actually from uh, I think quite a while ago where somebody asked you if you were going to be directing and you said no that is not in my skill set and I'm just I was so excited to see the direction you know as as a new part of your skill set and I'm just curious how how you came to it how you feel about it what you feel like you've learned about this whole medium as a director that you didn't know before Wow um, I guess. You know, I studied economics and uh, studio art in college um, with a concentration in photography. So I kind of kept going back and forth from like writing math proofs to like being in the dark room. And I always thought, I was like, what a waste of an education. Like, no. why didn't I go to drama school? Why didn't I study writing? You know, and then when I became, when I directed this, I thought, oh, no, I'm actually kind of going back to where I started, which is, in part that any artist nowadays, you have to be an entrepreneur as much as you are as an artist. There's just no other way through. So you gotta have your business hat on. <laughs> um, but the other part I think is that a really beautiful math proof, you're trying to get rid of any extraneous variables. You're trying to communicate a truth in the fewest number of lines and, and not waste anything. And a really beautiful math proof is like a poem. You know. It, it, it has this like energy about it, it's distilled. It's like the opposite of a novel. Um, and I was also studying mo images, you know? And so I think directing is really about the f merger of those things. It's like you're trying to make a poem of moving images and you're trying to not waste a single image. And I think the really great directors are the ones I admire, like Pakula. You know, when you watch a Pakula film, uh, like Parallax View or Clute or um, Pelican Brief even, which I love, or All the President's Men, you never feel like he's trying to tell you how good he is. He's never being like, oh, look at this great shot I set up. You know, he's he's making a frame that puts exactly into this on the screen what he needs to best communicate the story. You always feel as a director that he's in service to the story. Um, and I, I get that from that perspective of like merging the math proof with being in the dark room. Like, I feel like when I, you know, I see all my mistakes for sure. 
But sometimes I'll walk away from a day on set and I'll be like, I did get that in that setup. You know, I created the image that if you turned off the sound and you watched the whole scene without sound, you would feel the story. Yeah. I think we are out of time. Well, but I want to thank you so much for being here thank and thank you. all of yeah, you for being here. Thank you guys here. for coming on a Sunday. I appreciate wonderful. it.